Hi. Um, if you'll forgive the uh, insipid cliche, uh, we come from Russia with love. <laughs> At least for you, if not the rest of you. Um, I'm not presenting any of my own work today. I've been asked to uh, provide just a brief introduction to who uh, Professor Alexander Dugan is, uh, what Eurasianism is, which I imagine is a uh, pretty uh, foreign um, ideology and political thinking uh, to Western Europeans, um, and to its evolution to the fourth political theory, which is the book that I'm sure that you have all seen, um, Professor Dugan's first English language publication, um, and which he will be speaking about right after this. So, um, just briefly, uh, Alexander Gilevich Dugan. Um, he is, I do not think it is any exaggeration to say, the foremost political thinker, philosopher, traditionalist, and political commentator in Russia today. Um, if you can turn on Russian TV on any given day, and up pops Professor Dugan speaking on some political talk show, the Orthodox Religious Channel, um, commenting uh, in articles across the uh, spectrum of the press, um, he is pretty ubiquitous um, and has had a, a great deal of influence um, not only on government but on many other uh, political parties uh, and um, uh, thinkers in Russia. Um, he's best known in Russia for his Eurasianism geopolitics. But he has also um, done a lot of work in traditionalism, uh, philosophy, sociology, um, most recently uh, delving into international relations theory uh, and conservative politics. Um, he is also um, a, 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 a religious leader uh, of sorts, uh, an authority. Um, he himself is a, a Russian Orthodox of the old believers, um, which is an older uh, subsect of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church, um, which uh, hails back to older rituals and traditions. Um, and most recently, of course, with the fourth political theory. Uh, he was born in 1962 in Moscow, in what was then the Soviet Union. His father was a military intelligence and a candidate of law, and his mother was a doctor and a candidate of medicine. Uh, Professor Dugan originally studied uh, at Moscow Aviation Institute, where his um, ideas, um, when he was already breaking from uh, the Soviet norm, um, that would get him in no small amount of trouble uh, with uh, both the uh, authorities and with the academic uh, environment in the Soviet Union. He would later go on to do several doctorates. He originally worked as a journalist and then actually several other odd jobs uh, and would then become a political activist leader uh, and commentator after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 92. He speaks nine languages, uh, almost all of them self-taught. Um, as to his political trajectory, uh, Professor Dugan would bring traditionalism and the new right from Europe uh, to Russia. And he also brought about a resurgence of a particularly uh, Russian school of thought, uh, Eurasianism, uh, in a new form as Neo-Eurasianism. He uh, founded uh, originally um, the nationalist group uh, Kamyat. Um, and um, in his early years, uh, in the uh, late 80s and 90s, he researched and dabbled into the new right, fascism, the occult, mysticism, Gnosticism, traditionalism, and orthodoxy. Um, not necessarily today holding to some of those uh, factions, but having investigated each one thoroughly. Um, he was the um, creator and principal writer for the New Right Journal, uh, Elementi, and numerous Eurasianist uh, journals and publications during the 90s. He has been active in Russian politics across the entirety of the political spectrum, with the exception of the uh, extremely fringe minority liberals. 
Um, he created the National Bolshevik Party uh, in cooperation with Edward Limonov um, and basically formed the, their principal manifesto and school of thought in Russia. He also created the International uh, Eurasian Movement, uh, which is uh, still uh, his primary vehicle today. But he has also had influence on the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, which is not really very communist in any form. It can't essentially be considered as a successor to uh, the communists of the Soviet Union. For instance, they are religious um, and, uh, and are nationalist, uh, for one thing, uh, many other differences. But he essentially wrote the manifesto uh, that the, uh, the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. He has had a great deal of influence on the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is not liberal, not democratic, and <laughs> not really a party, it's a cult of personality. Um, but needless to say, uh, yes, uh, politics of Russia is such a party, really. <laughs> Um, but he has had a great deal of influence on uh, their leader, particularly uh, in geopolitics, uh, Zhirinovsky. He uh, was one of the original founders of the brief-lived party uh, Rodina, which was a, a um, nationalist left party in some ways, um, but probably not the way it is in Europe or the United States. Uh, they're social conservatives. Um, he has had also a great deal of influence on the dominant uh, power party today, uh, United Russia. Um, he has um, had a great deal of influence on Russian military thought, particularly in geopolitics. He has taught at the academy for the uh, general staff. Um, he has been an advisor to the Duma on matters of geopolitics and foreign policy. Um, he has had, I think, uh, a great deal of indirect influence on uh, President Putin um, and was invited to the, uh, his recent inauguration. Um, and he has had a great deal of influence on the president of uh, Kazakhstan, our Sultan Nazarbayev, um, where uh, Eurasianism is officially, uh, pretty much essentially, the official state ideology. Uh, he teaches today uh, at Moscow State University in the sociology faculty. Uh, he is also the chair of Center for Conservative Studies uh, and the head of the Department of International Relations within the Sociology Faculty. He is a regular political commentator on Russian TV, radio, and newspapers. He is an insanely prodigious author with well over 20 major books and innumerable novelettes, journals, papers, articles, pamphlets, and other publications. Um, in my work of uh, uh, getting the process with some translations and revisions for, of his work for Arctos, um, I found that um, I do not even get a third of uh, one of his works uh, translated before he's already finished three others. He uh, pretty much functions as a one-man think tank on geopolitics, foreign relations, security, and domestic politics uh, in Russia, and, uh, uh, and also a countries of Central Asia. Um, he's pretty much formed a monopoly across large swaths of the uh, ideological and political spectrum in Russia, where he has had some degree of influence on nearly everyone. Um, in this, he can be said to have adopted uh, a right-wing version of Gramscian politics, uh, that the uh, path to political power lays through um, a cultural in that way, um, much of his work is not uh, focused on popular mass electoral politics um, as it, uh, we usually think of politics in Europe or the United States. Um, but politics in Russia tends to come from the top down. So he is focused on entryism and elite uh, and academic influence. Um, he maintains, as you can see, he has a great variety of interests, of which he is essentially an expert on all of them, um, and he maintains circles, overlapping circles of interest and initiation um, that he moves one from the other and interacts with all of them, the traditionalists, the Iranians, um, uh, geopolitical foreign policy people, uh, and so on. So uh, just briefly, uh, 
this is a partial list of some of the books that he's published in Russian. Some of them, uh, Foundations of Geopolitics, stands out as one of his most famous ones, uh, particularly in Russia, but um, it's gotten some uh, quite some traction outside of Russia as well. Um, Fourth Political Theory is his first major publication in English, although the next two volumes in this trilogy, The Theory of a Multipolar World and The Rise of Civilizations, will quickly follow uh, with uh, Arctos' help. Um, he's currently working on um, a work on Heidegger and on Platonism and Neoplatonism. Um, just briefly, uh, classical Eurasianism has its roots in 18th and 19th century Slavophilism, but um, quickly um, uh, took on a, a life of its own and went in some very different directions. <coughs> It was created in the 1920s by Russian emigrate uh, communities in Europe. Um, principal of these are Prince Trubitskoy, Savitsky, Florovsky, and a bunch of other names that you don't know. Um, as it's the heart of its premise is Russia is the heart of a unique Eurasian civilization, um, separate uh, culturally from Europe and Asia, but affecting and being affected by both. It functions as a meta-ideology um, covering uh, thought in history, geography, geopolitics, politics, sociology, culture, art, economics, and even biology and environmentalism, and one of the principal uh, areas of importance uh, for uh, Eurasianism is religion. Um, but um, Eurasianism uh, favors all of the four or five major traditional religions of Russia, uh, spanning back several hundred uh, years, uh, uh, orthodoxy, uh, traditional Sufi Islam, uh, Kalmyk Buddhism, uh, and even uh, a particular form of Eurasian Judaism. Uh, as such, uh, different, very different from the nation-state development uh, in Europe, Russia is its own context. Uh, we have never been a nation-state, um, and uh, Eurasianists uh, strongly believe in the multi-confessional and multi-ethnic uh, facets of, of what we can only call an empire uh, in truth, uh, not a nation state even today. As such, uh, Eurasianism believe, uh, strongly promotes the unity of the Russia and Turkic peoples and recognizes that the Mongol period, uh, the Golden Horde, was the pivotal period that shaped what Russia is today although it does not uh, certainly deny the influence of the uh, Kiev Jews as well. So basically, the idea of Eurasianism is that Russia must unlearn the West and that it is a unique and specific mode of development. Um, Neo-Eurasianism emerged uh, with the ending years of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, Lev Gamimov and Alexander Panarin were two of the other major thinkers. Uh, both of them have passed away. And Alexander Dugin is now the uh, uh, unchallenged master of Eurasianism uh, in Russia and across the former Soviet Union. Um, you could say that he has his disciples, um, of which uh, I must admit I'm a groovy fanboy. Um, Neo-Eurasianism posits Eurasianism as a necessity uh, for a Russian ideology to preserve what we have left. Uh, and as an expression in saving the identity of wider Eurasia. Um, it sees its destiny to resist the West as the particular uh, political project of modernity and the Enlightenment, and uh, Atlanticism, uh, which is primarily seen as an American or anglo american uh, ideology and uh, movement. So it's essentially a party, a movement, now, uh, lastly, uh, we see that Eurasianism has uh, led forth from a particular Russian context to uh, his political thought, which has wider implications uh, for the rest of the world. And this is uh, the evolution to the fourth political theory, where we see Professor Dugan has at times worked uh, within national Bolsheviks, uh, uh, social conservative uh, communist circles, um, uh, some dabbling with uh, uh, traditionalist thought of Vola, what um, has some connections with fascism, but uh, then Eurasianism. Uh, but today, the fourth political theory seeks to deconstruct liberalism, communism, and fascism, 
and create a political ideology for the future. We see uh, we are living in a post-political, post-modernity era, uh, a destructive and universalistic homogeneity, um, whose principal vector is neoliberal capitalism. Um, it's expressed through consumerism and a global military Western hegemony. So this is, has been called the triumph of liberalism and the end of history by Francis Fukuyama. Um, with its results in a simulacrum of post-humanity uh, and uh, that is well on its path, uh, suicidal path to its own apocalypse. Uh, the fourth political theory seeks to save the redeemable, redeemable portions of the three earlier ideologies. Um, and reforge a new politics for the world, and in a sense to turn the tools of modernity against itself. And it seeks a new multipolar world of unique and cultural and civilizational diversity, each in its own place, grounded in history, culture, religion, and spirituality. And uh, I'll close you with a few pictures. We see Professor Dugan in some of his wilder, younger days. Um, and uh, also uh, more recently. And lastly, Spasiba, thank you, Art uh, We owe everything uh, today to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sleboda. Uh, Mr. Sleboda will not be taking any questions now. We will move on. <laughs> the speech by Professor Dukin right away, and uh, then you will have the, the opportunity to uh, put questions to both these gentlemen. Uh, I now leave the floor to uh, Professor Alexander Dukin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank great thank to Mark for such a marvelous presentation. I am impressed. Uh, so um, I think that um, I would like to, to introduce three um, major topics of what um, it seems to be of most importance um, in, uh, in our meeting in Sweden. So, um, by, by the way, uh, do you know that Russia was called, the territory of Russia in the ancient time was called White Sweden, uh, White Sweden. So it was, um, I think, that uh, b between uh, Russian uh, ancient history and um, Scandinavian uh, German um, uh, ancient history, there are, uh, are many links, uh, and little of them are sufficiently explored. So um, we should know about our people, our culture more than only uh, this historical period, period uh, that is linked to the national statehood, as uh, our Eurasianists affirmed Russia uh, have had a state, had a state, and uh, have, has it now, but uh, never it was national state. So the reality is much more rich uh, in the details, and um, the relations between the cultures and between ethnic groups and the races uh, is more more complex. So I think that uh, we could um, also speak about Eurasian roots of the Swedish culture because uh, many ancient German tribes uh, were from uh, from Eurasian Eurasian steppes. So, uh, but uh, to discover the Eurasian roots of European ethnical groups. It is uh, very uh, fascinating topics, but I will not speak about it. It's, uh, by the way, uh, I only uh, like to stress that it is possible, and that Eurasia could be considered as something 
common to um, uh, the European people and to the Russian people. My friend Alain de Benoit uh, once had said that we could uh, regard Eurasia as great space of Indo-European ethnical groups, very different, uh, but also having some very important point in common. But uh, today I would like to speak about three topics. First of all, about my book, <coughs> The Fourth Political Theory, uh, that uh, I would like to uh, say uh, thanks to um, Artos that organizes this conference and um, this publishing house um, is responsible for publishing my first uh, real book uh, in English. There were before only um, kind of leaflets, pamphlets, not a book, uh, uh, complete book. So um, uh, I would like to say some words concerning this theory introduced already by Mr. Sloboda. Uh, as well, I would like to say some words concerning Eurasianism, or maybe it will be also some questions uh, about this ideology, and uh, some words about uh, the theory, the theory of multipolar world. Uh, the topics are linked, and I will try to, to show what is the core, the axis for all three levels of understanding the world we are living in now and the world world we are going to live tomorrow. So, uh, first of all, fourth political theory. Fourth political theory is, to start with, open concept. It is not the answer. It is not the structure of some concrete principles and ideas. It is not system, not yet, but it is a kind of invitation to uh, political and ideological imagination. The fourth political history, th this concept was born uh, between myself and Alain de Benoit during his stay in Moscow when we discussed about situation we are, uh, we are in now. And first of all, the most important thing now, it is the fact recognized by majority of the researchers and experts and intellectuals the fact of the end of classical ideologies. So, in the last two centuries, we were dealing mostly with three political ideologies, major political ideologies. Uh, the first one that was born before, earlier than the other, was at that now is in agony is liberalism. Liberalism is political ideology with its subject, with its system, with its concrete and very um, palpable values. It is something that is um, coherent, coherent, and uh, it could be accept or reject basing on our intellectual, political, moral, religious, philosophical, ideological decision. Liberalism, it, not, it is not only the attitude or economic doctrines of Adam Smith. It's much more than that. That's a kind of theology. It is very important to stress that because liberals themselves often uh, uh, reject that they have an ideology. They like to, the, uh, they are used to represent liberalism as something natural, but it is absolutely, it is construction. It is set of values, system of theories. In, in this sense, Marx, who studied 
bourgeoisie and capitalism as ideological phenomenon and that has recognized that we are dealing not with the state of thing, natural state of thing, but with ideology. That uh, means that we are dealing uh, with capitalism as some construct, uh, construct, uh, construction. Uh, they are those who have constructed this construction and they have implemented this construction in our life. And it is kind of artificial, as always in the human society, artificial action. So, liberalism is ideology. We could call it first ideology, because it's, uh, it uh, was born first and lasts more than other. The second ideology was a kind of critical response to the liberalism, that was Marxism. Marxism was very important ideological attitude to liberalism, but in the heart of the Marxism is recognition of very central points of liberalism. So Marxism was rejection of capitalism, but at the same time acceptance, acceptance of some of its important and core values. For example, individual uh, and Marxism um, uh, recognize uh, capitalism uh, as a form more progressive than feudalism. So communism should, over, should overcome capitalism, but uh, regarding, for example, pre-capitalist society, Marxists were in favor of capitalist revolution and um, capitalist, uh, um, capitalist uh, ideology. So it was post-capitalist ideology, and uh, Marxists uh, think that it will be the future of capitalism, Marxism and socialism and communism. So this ideology was the second to appear on the historical scene and has had huge success in the 20th century. The success that, that was overwhelming as such a complicated, sophisticated, critical ideology was implemented in the largest part of the world, where the capitalism was felt as something negative, as something, something unacceptable. I don't. Uh, I am going not to to uh, describe the the history of socialism in 20th century. Let us agree that it was really important and impressive. Uh, uh, in Russian history, it was a real and bloody catastrophe, but also it was something of fundamental uh, that uh, touched anybody. Any, any level of reality in our Russian history. The third political his, uh, ideology is fascism or nationalism or national socialism. I, am, I speak about the big um, family of different, uh, different ideologies united by um, the name of third way. Uh, this ideology was reaction against capitalism. It's very important. In the roots of the third way ideology was rejection of liberalism and capitalism. But at the same time, third ide ideology rejected Marxism as uh, not sufficient reaction against capitalism. It was very particular and very a uh, very special kind of ideology, but it also could uh, regard, uh, reg uh, could be regarded uh, as something very impressive, very historically proved, empirically proved, uh, that possessed a kind of systematical, political, and ideological expression. So the regimes of uh, Hitler and Mussolini as regimes of liberals and regimes of communists 
uh, all of them were historical facts and historical facts and theoretical system. So we could compare one with another system and fact, but in, in the principle, what is important? All three political theories were realized in the concrete his, historical process. So we could judge their uh, content theoretically, philosophically, ideologically, but also we could judge the implication and results of their implementation in the reality, historical reality. Uh, the first uh, the, 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 uh, political theory that uh, was burned last, uh, uh, third way, uh, was defeated first. So it disappeared after uh, 40, uh, uh, one, one, uh, uh, 1945, and uh, only the rest of this ideology uh, were conserved in some part of third world. There is very interesting uh, political thinker, Dmitry Kitsikis, of Greek origin, living in Canada, uh, who was in Moscow. Uh, he uh, affirmed uh, that uh, he affirms that there are, there were uh, also regimes of her position in the Arab world, and now we are witnesses of complete destruction of the last type of this regime. In the Nasser, that was Egypt, uh, Basist Arab uh, countries were uh, also co were considered to be a kind of uh, third world, third way ideology. So, Gaddafi is fallen, uh, Saddam Hussein is fallen, the last third ideology type of regime is falling now, is Bashar Assad. So, uh, all the history of the fascism, fascism is over. In Europe, it was for a long time ago. Now, the last post-fascist regime is falling before our eyes. So, it is over with fascism, with national socialism. It is over with communism. Communism was defeated definitively and uh, 91. So there is nothing more of communism. Also, there are some rests, some uh, the, some last points without much importance on the world scale. And what we have? We have the first ideology that is now in very particular position. Liberalism struggled against communism and against fascism. Liberalism with communism has defeated fascism, third political ideology, and after that, liberalism has defeated the uh, second political theory and second ideology, communism. Now, he is the only one that we are dealing with, liberalism. But, Without the animus, liberalism loses its content, its theoretical uh, consistency. It becomes not political ideology, but everyday practice. Liberalism, it, it is now normal, natural, something that goes but itself. We are all liberals in the uh, everyday life, because we are living in the liberal democracy, uh, in the parliamentary democracy, uh, in the capitalist market system, uh, and we, in one way or another, recognize or are obliged to recognize human rights and the, uh, and the other liberal ide ideological position. It is necessary, but it is not felt by majority of the population as implementation of ideology. It's a kind of natural way of thinking, but it is 
we don't we don't need to uh, for, forget we are dealing with political ideology that is easy to deconstruct and to show the first principles of it the dogmas of liberalism for example individual is the measure of the thing there is nothing above individual individual is access in the, n n not any collective identity could be recognized uh, in liberalism, in liberal attitude, in liberal paradigm, because uh, the man is equal not to the other man. Uh, that is the root of equality. The man is equal to himself. That is a dogma of liberalism. The man, individual, is nothing other than individual. Peter is Peter, nothing uh, nothing, uh, nothing else. He is not Christian, nor, nor uh, Muslim, nor European, nor black, nor white. No, and after that, a very important point, liberalism uh, put to the logical end cannot recognize the gender because to be woman or to be man that means that we have collective identity, that there are the other woman and uh, the man, uh, so we are part of the whole. But this contradicts, absolutely contradicts to liberal basic, 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 basic principle. So the queer studies on the academic level or gay rights or um, defense of uh, homosexuality and uh, the, uh, uh, the other other uh, issue, it is not only byproduct of liberalism, it is the core of liberalism because it is the last consequences of its anthropological attitude. Individual is equal to individual, to itself. It, the principle of absolute uh, individual identity. And more and more open and explicit negation of possibility of other identity. That is why liberalism is against fascism, against third way, against nation. Liberalism against nation because that race is collective identity. Nation statehood is collective identity. Class communist class is also constructed by collective identity. Women and men also, uh, they are collective identity. So liberalism needs a pure human being as a norm. Uh, the idea of human right means that individual has not the uh, necessity to uh, belong to some society. He is only human individual, without uh, without uh, uh, passport, without uh, identity, without uh, the fatherland, without any kind of collective identification. He is a numerical individual, and he, being individual, he has all the right of the human. It is a kind of anthropology, individualistic anthropology, very deeply rooted in the liberalism. So it is now imposed by all society, starting from United States and Europe, but going to Russia, going to Chinese, going to uh, the other Asiatic, uh, Asian uh, societies, and uh, so on. It is worldly. Uh, worldly attack of liberalism uh, with infrastructure of color to revolution mentioned by other speaker very opportunity uh, opportunity so uh, we are dealing with ideology that now is finishing with the rest of the previous ideological ideological uh, systems. So, the idea is if we are living under liberalism, liberalism that has lost 
all its enemy that now is absolute and changing in its nature because it, uh, we need, as Carl Schmitt declared uh, many times, uh, we need to be in politics, we need enemy. Uh, without enemy, we have no identity. Now liberalism has not enemy because there is no more any uh, coher coherent, coherently uh, constructed political system alternative to liberalism. Liberalism is the only one. So it is uh, in front of itself. Uh, so it is new kind of liberalism. Li liberalism without enemy, open society and its enemy of Karl Popper, it's something completely other than liberalism with the enemy, enemy mentioned enemies mentioned uh, earlier, um, before. So, I, uh, my idea is, if we reject liberalism in present form, if we are in dissent with status quo of actual, uh, actual reality, if we challenge the state of thing and uh, so challenging liberalism or what we are uh, what we are having now as a matter of fact we should uh, struggle against with one ideology with the su support uh, with the support of the other we need alternative we we have had two alternatives in the last two centuries. These, these alternatives I have mentioned. They have lost. They are defeated. They are eradicated from uh, human society. And we are dealing with the absolute liberalism that now cannot be uh, cannot be attacked from classical position of uh, second ideology Marxism or third ideology. That was original idea of uh, Alain de Benoit and myself, and I have tried, and it, it was also something in common with the new right on Europe in the early 90s, we uh, have imagined the idea to join uh, extreme left and far left and far right, so that different arrests of second and third political theory to propose to liberalism winning liberalism, some new alternative, because separately left sec uh, second ideology and uh, far right uh, third ideology were defeated. It was a kind of national Bolshevism as a concept. So the idea to unite both wings in the far, that far because the uh, uh, near to the liberalism, they become uh, far left and, uh, and um, oh, sorry, uh, center left and uh, uh, center right. That's something completely manipulated by liberalism. Because, for example, American right and American left are all absolutely uh, the same, absolutely similar, and both parties are absolutely liberal. Liberalism is dogma for all kind of political reality in the United States, and it is more or less so with some differences in Europe. Uh, but after that, uh, I have uh, I have uh, come to the con uh, arrived to the conclusion at the conclusion that it is not uh, good to to make archaeological 
work in the history of political ideas. We should imagine something other than uh, this uh, idea to unite um, the rest of the political ideologies of the past and defeated, lost. Maybe they were uh, good because they were anti-liberal. All that is anti-liberal is good, from my opinion. But uh, they have lost the battle. So proclaiming, declaring ourselves the heirs of this ideology, we immediately are the heirs of the losers. And it is, it is so because new actual far right and far left movements are the losers movement. So they, uh, including anthropologically, uh, so we need, and the other reason, most uh, more important one, is that uh, all these second and third political ideology were deeply rooted in the modernity. All three political theory or political ideologies were modern in their essence. So, if liberalism has finally gained the situation and this battle uh, of the ideas, it was precisely because it is, it is and was and will be more modern than the other. That was the struggle for the sense of modernity. Communists thought they were most, more modern than liberalism, the liberal, liberals. They thought they will come next, but they were pre-modern. They were not uh, uh, after liberalism. That liberalism, as an example of our Russian history, uh, proves uh, liberal come after communist, communists. So it is very interesting, the logic of communism, of Marxism, is reversed, is completely destroyed. That, that, uh, that proved to be false, erroneous. So, the idea is that all mod, 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 modern ideology, uh, all modern ideology now are presented in the liberalism. So, in a kind, we have a democratization and the freedom of moral, that was one of the important points of Marxism. Now it is realized by the liberalism. We have a kind of racism as a universalism of Western capitalist uh, European American values. And it is kind to recognize Western culture in actual modern and postmodern state as, uh, as something universal is a typical feature of racism, of cultural and intellectual technological racism. And uh, so we have all modernity, all modernity in one concrete phenomenon, in liberalism. So, the, we, uh, the, the struggle for the sense of modernity was gained by liberals. Modernity is liberal, not fascist, not communist. They all were recognized as something, something pre-modern, so traditionalist. And the last uh, point, that um, the last step is to, to make now, is uh, to imagine fourth political theory beyond the modernity, not to quarrel with the liberalism about modernity. That is a fixed, that is a fact. Modernity is in the hand of liberalists, or liberals, of uh, li liberalism. And let modernity be in these hands. Let us transcend modernity. Let us go beyond the modernity. Let us reject not only results of modernity that are 
in the liberalism, but the sources and the roots of modernity that were the base, intellectual and pragmatic base of modernity. So that is a kind of invita invitation for fourth political system, uh, theory. We, we, no, we, need, we need to imagine something non-modern, anti-modern, anti-liberal, and without appeal to the uh, second and third political theory. Because at a kind of mark of the best, if we uh, say today, for example, that we are uh, third way, it is, it is finished, as the uh, pre uh, previous speaker has uh, mentioned. Uh, I completely agree with that. Uh, but, for example, in uh, Eastern Europe, the same with communists. If if you declare you are communist, that's 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 all. Uh, liberal liberals criminal uh, have criminalized their political enemies, uh, enemies of open society. So the only only issue, only possibility that rests now, it is to struggle against modernity, modernity in the whole in all principles, in all, in all aspects. And uh, that is that we need to construct completely new political theory, fourth political theory. Deconstructing the modernity and deconstructing previous or existing, existing political theories, we should at the same time not uh, stay with only with criticism, with critics, but we should construct something instead of think deconstructed. So, it is easy to say, but not easy to do. So, uh, there could not be someone who would say us, I have imagined for political theory, it's completely absurd, it's stupid, it is impossible. But there can be the people, can be intellectual people, uh, spiritual people, polit politically active people who could affirm we are against modernity and against liberalism. That's the same. We are absolutely against not only results but against the principles of modernity. So we, are, we uh, need to restore the tradition. We should make appeal to the pre-modernity and recognize pre-modern values. Pre-modern values, values now forgotten, now completely out of the market. And doing uh, such a thing as uh, revi uh, uh, reviving pre-modern set of values, we, we could not be only critical or ar uh, archaic, archaic. We could propose these pre-modern value as post-modern set of values. So liberals know only one post-modernity, liberal post-modernity, that will be exactly uh, as uh, our friend have said, continuation of the same, the same system of value, but in the state of delayed or deferred collapse. I completely agree with this analysis. So, postmodernity for the liberals is the same modernity, but uh, a little bit more relaxed or deferred or delayed. Uh, uh, the collapse. Collapse is delayed in postmodernity of liberalism. They are not post; they are modern, but in, in the last in the last sigh of modernity, they could not give to the modernity the energy. They could not give to the modernity the spirit, the force, the power. They use the modernity up to the uh, last last uh, point, uh, last drop of water. It's, uh, they uh, optimize, they uh, uh, don't create anymore. Modernity was creation. They could only use, optimize or deconstruct. 
and deconstructing all about uh, around them the liberals and liberal postmodernists deconstruct also the status quo or themselves and we don't need to fight for the values that belong to the modern past we should fight for the values that belong to the pre-modern past that could be and should be taken as future values really future values that is idea of fourth political theory but to make this we should completely reverse our attitude to the past we don't struggle for the past that has <coughs> passed but for the eternity that was reflected in the traditional society because when the uh, when uh, when uh, the church the church or the religion says the god is eternal it means what it says it was the god was not uh, eternal and now he is dead as uh, in the uh, modernist version um, uh, is uh, presumed the god is not construction or for the modernity he god is constructed object but for the pre-modernity not at all so we will return we should return to the pre-modern comprehension of uh, understanding pre-modern understanding of pre-modernity and that was very important in the traditionalists as Evola, Julius Evola and René Guénon. We need to accept pre-modernity in full, in whole, and to give the critics of modernity starting from pre-modern point. It is not extreme conservatism. It's a kind of futurism because now we need to make not uh, hundred steps behind but one only but heroic and very difficult step in front of us uh, so that is idea to go right to go to the future and overcome this never-ending end of uh, uh, liberalism uh, liberal decay so idea is to put pre-modern values as post-modern project as post-modern construction they say to us uh, your past doesn't exist anymore your churches are completely abandoned your traditions are completely forgotten if we start to prove the contrary and argue with argue with them that is kind of arbitrary but we could say yes but past we have lost we haven't lost eternity if we will seek in the source of eternity we will imagine we will discover we will manifest the hidden truths we will create a new traditions we will organize a spiritual movement we could make it if we believe in eternity and if to believe in eternity that means that does mean that we don't believe in modernity because modernity is all time, is completely in, in uh, 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 pure uh, time and historicity. Now coming to its end. So the idea of fourth political theory is to propose new kind of post-modernity where there is a, a, a real interruption of modernity. If they want to defer collapse, we should make the collapse we should say enough uh, that is not uh, that doesn't work anymore you 
the end of your history is now accomplished. It's something that is realized, something fulfilled. It's not in the future. The end of liberalism uh, cannot continue uh, eternally. It is historical end of history and it could not last forever. And in this situation, we are a kind of nihilist and anarchist regarding from the point of modernity, because we are absolutely against our, all ontology, anthropology, gnosiology of modernity, any morality, all of that. So in this uh, kind, we are destructors of modernity and we, we, we want to modernity to end finally and not delay this end. On the other hand, we don't need to revive the tradition. Maybe in some situation it is impossible. We need to construct the tradition against modernity. We need to discover the tradition in the source of eternity and not, on, uh, the, not uh, only in historical and secondary uh, sources now forgotten. It is heroical task. It's not so simple, but it is theoretically possible. If we feel really impossibility to live in the actual world, we have not other solution, uh, and we need to create, elaborate fourth political theory. To uh, to end with these uh, topics, I would only propose one direction of um, um, intellectual uh, the development of this idea. Three political uh, ideologies uh, have uh, had three main subjects. The uh, subject, central subject of liberalism was and is individual. So, rejecting uh, liberalism. We should reject this subject. So individual doesn't exist. We should go against it because individualism is a kind of liberal anthropology. Individual should not exist or at least he should not be taken as a subject of political system. So he exists but secondary and not as normative basic measure of the things. The man is not measure of the things. It's first principle. Rejecting individual, we are rejecting the whole philosophical, theoretical, political, social infrastructure. Secondary, uh, second political theory has had class as political actor or subject. So we need to reject a class class as a way of thinking. It was very uh, interesting kind of political mentality to think in classes, uh, but it is all over. We don't need to think in classes. So we should reject a class as, class as a political actor. And third, uh, National Socialism recognize race as historical actor and fascism, Mussolini, recognize state as historical, historical uh, actor and topic. We should not repeat uh, their, their um, errors because uh, uh, state is absolutely, as Julius Evola has shown is absolutely modern creation. The uh, ancient traditional society didn't know the sta state, stated capitalist creation. And race is something that uh, is not proved uh, theoretically. It was a kind of uh, construction. Ethnics group exists, but the idea 
of, of, of the rays is uh, not uh, clearly defined and cannot serve uh, as political agenda. So, we have not individual, we have not class, we have not race or state. Who would be or what would be the center of fourth political theory? That was uh, debates. There were there was there was debates um, between myself and Alain de Benoit and other friends, who could uh, fill this void in, in political theory. And speaking and thinking about that, I propose pragmatic solution. It could be Heideggerian concept of design. Design, it's being there. If there is not individual, it is construction individual, social construction. If there is not state or race or class, also the other modern social constructions, so there is always something absolutely empirically proven. It is our being, our being in existential being in the world. So, this design, after exploring what is it, and with Heidegger, Heidegger is central to creation of fourth political theory, exploring what is design with Heidegger, we will come to the conclusion that there is not only one design. Heidegger studied only one design. It is design uh, being there of Western civilization, Western culture. Uh, searching deeper, we could discover the, uh, the other kinds of design. For example, in Japanese culture, on Chinese culture, on Hindu culture, they are different. So the idea is that we have not only one kind of fourth political theory, but different groups or, or, or different families of four, fourth political theory rejecting modernity, appealing to design uh, being there, but at the same time concretizing the, the, the design in the concrete space, cultural and geographical and historical space. So design is a kind of axis of uh, fourth political theory, and now we are going to the multipolarity briefly. So idea is that when we come to fourth political theory affirming that the subject or the main actor of this theory should be designed, we immediately receive the vision of the future, of post-liberal future. That is a kind of multipolarity where poles of this multipolarity are different edition of design. Designs uh, or being there of different culture and different people. We will have a kind of the map where there are not any more nation states but or uh, political system, but we will have civilizations. Civilizations as a, a borders of particular design. Design that uh, as being there of concrete culture, of concrete people, of concrete tradition, going with its proper existential time. Because there are societies where the time is cyclic. There are society where the times is linear. There are society where, are, where, where, where times are represented as something complex, as something mixed. So there could not be any common measure for all designs. Every designs, design is particular, is unequal, is different from the other. And there is not any common scale that we could judge this design is better or that is better. They are different 
and incomparable incom between themselves. So we are arriving, developing this way of thinking, we are arriving to the concept of multipolarity, not the world uh, organized on the basis of the civilizations. They could be uh, in the peaceful relations, they could be in some, um, some conflicts. It, it is uh, that history of real human being is open. So we could not predict if we construct the multipolar multipolarity, there will be necessarily the wars. Maybe there will be the wars, maybe not. For example, new uh, unipolar world or non-polar world that we have now have many wars, wars under pretext that uh, they are humanitarian wars against the people. But when the people kill the other people, it is a war, humanitarian or not. Maybe the wars of multipolarity will be not humanitarian. Maybe there will be the peace because having different civilization with comparable, comparable possibility to defend themselves, they prefer logically peace and not the war. So the idea uh, of multipolarity is not uh, accept unipolarity of American domination, not accept no polarity um, promoted by CFR or Soros or Bilderbergers, uh, that is not return to the bipolarity, because it is impossible, there is no uh, re realistic other second pole now in the uh, uh, actual situation. So we should think in the terms of different poles that could be more or less, more or less compatible. Uh, con concretely speaking, we could imagine such a multipolar world where there is American design, very particular, but let uh, them choose what they want. American pole, American civilization. There is something con concretely existing. The other pole of multipolarity should be continental Europe with particular identity, European continental identity, very different from American Atlantis, uh, Western identity, Europe of the roots, Europe of the traditions, Europe discovered and constructed beyond the modernity. So the Europe of the people, the Europe of the religious and cultural particularities, multiple Europe, not united in, in the sense of existence on one set of norms. The norms could be different, but there's a kind of civilization and geopolitical unity. The greatest Europe, but different and completely free and dependent from the United States. So we will have new pole of China that is not only China as a state. There are also many regions in the world that are more or less controlled by Chinese. There will be India that is not also only country because it's a kind of, of civilization. We will have Islamic civilization maybe divided, and I would prefer it to be divided in Shia and Sunni parts. Uh, uh, so, and of uh, Southern America civilization, South American design, and uh, finally we, we come to the Eurasia. What is Eurasia in this concept, Eurasianism? The idea of Eurasia is not Russia as a state, but particular Eurasian civilization that also includes in itself uh, post-Soviet space and maybe some other other territories or space, not of uh, uh, direct st uh, uh, state domination, national domination of Russia. No, that Eurasia and Eurasianist, first Eurasianist about which Mark Sleboda uh, uh, told, 
you also uh, um, wrote the word Russia Eurasia with uh, as one word Russia Eurasia Russia Eurasia it's something different from the Russia as country Russia Eurasia or Eurasia is not a country it's not Russian speaking population it a kind of great civilizational possibility that was known in the history as Turanic civilization that was uh, uh, territory of Thithian and uh, um, uh, Sarmatian Alan uh, after the two after them Turkish and Mongolian but it was the same political space and cultural space where different ethnical groups were living together so Eurasia is a kind of civilization, as a kind of design being there, Eurasian being there, with not clearly defined defined borders, because the borders of the pole or civilization are something different from the borders of the state. The problem of the borders and the multipolarity is uh, very interesting, very fascinating. It's a topic, but we could not have, we have not time to uh, um, discuss it now, uh, at least uh, in my speech. So, the idea is that Eurasianism is a kind of insistence of particularity of Russian Eurasian design, Russian civilization, that is not only, Russia is not only the country of European country, because if you make comparison between European country and Russia, you will uh, understand that it is or very, very poor and very, uh, very bad, very ugly European country or something other, because uh, there is no universal standard. Russia cannot, uh, uh, cannot satisfy European standards simply because it's not, it not Europe and not a country. It is a kind of civilization that should be uh, discovered, that should be understood, that should be revival. This, uh, th that was the main goal of uh, first Eurasianists about uh, their heritage. We have uh, constructed our new Eurasianist theory. But the concept of Eurasia, Eurasia now accepted by Mr. Putin, and on this concept, now is basing Russian politics in the near abroad, so in the post-Soviet country. It is explicitly taken from our uh, geopolitical discourse and uh, our uh, uh, political philosophy. Also, with the insistence of the multipolarity that is fixed in the most important documents of modern Russia, we have a part of Eurasian program at least accepted by important uh, political circles that are in the, in the head of, of our country. So now we have different, different level. Eurasia as civilization, multipolarity as a vision of the future world, and fourth political theory as political construction, uh, uh, construction and ideological construction as a kind of political philosophy or uh, fourth ideology that will guide us from the, uh, from the dead end of uh, liberalism. So I um, uh, would, uh, would like to finish my presentation by the words, the alternative is possible. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Professor Dubin? <laughs> Uh, 
I have, uh, I have uh, translated in my youth, when I was 18, I translated uh, Imperialismo Pagano, Heidnische Imperialism uh, from German, uh, because it was the only book that I have found in the uh, closed sectors of uh, bibliotheques of Lenin, the only one of Evola and in German. I have um, made the translation of uh, Heidnische Imperialismus, and after that I have known uh, m m many years after that in Italy also this book was translated from the German because it's my, uh, richer, m more rich uh, in the content than I Italian, first Italian um, edition. So, uh, um, Imperialismo Pagano, Heidnische Imperialismus uh, was a kind of first political and traditionalist book that I have translated and uh, that was uh, very important for me because for me there were there were two authors fun fundamental René Guénon and, and Julius Evola. René Guénon um, has made the basis of my rejection of uh, modernity and um, traditionalism. I uh, am indebted to Guénon in all, but Julius Evola uh, was also crucial for me because he has shown that the only possibility to defend the tradition is to fight and never recognize tradition as something parallel. It is alternative or the modernity or the tradition and the life of Evola, not so much his writing. I have written, uh, I have uh, read them many times and I have uh, translated also the other uh, uh, parts uh, of his uh, books and uh, many articles and so on, but for me not so much his uh, articles are of importance, but his example. Uh, I think um, that it was completely stride in a any sense of, of the words Ebola. He uh, has, he had ideals, he had ideas and he all his life struggled struggled with all his heart for these uh, ideas so for me it is example existential so uh, example i think uh, that um, i think that uh, the figure of julius evola now is more important uh, much more important than majority of other traditionalists on one hand and uh, third wave politicians uh, also. He was, he was ever uh, marginal in his time in uh, Italy on Germany. But now we could not uh, remember the names of great fascist hierarchs, but uh, maybe Minister of Agriculture of uh, Germany, we, we, his name says us nothing, but Evola is something that not only present, but that is growing. His influence is growing, his uh, significance is growing, uh, his example is growing. So I think that Evolaism is a kind uh, of very actual uh, attitude and uh, once more, for me, more, uh, more important his attitude to reality than concrete details of his right. Um, I'd say that for me, Avola, I'll just say briefly, his focus on nature, uh, paganism, the cult of the earth, and his concept of a metaphysics of war, where uh, conflict, ideological, um, conflict of ideas and physical is a necessity of the human condition. Yes? Um, this, this is, is a rather And there's different wealth levels in the world, 
And um, in some cases, people want some of one thing, which might be their cultural past, and some of something else, which might be this US um, consumerist idea. How do we transition? That is very in, uh, important questions. First of all, all human history, as Nietzsche said, is the battle of ideas. Ideas. So first of all, the transition begins when begins the search of alternative, and when the alternative is more or less created in the mind and the spirits of the people. It is first a very important, maybe most important step to transition. Uh, second step is a kind to reconsider collapse. I completely agree. We need to consider and reconsider collapse. What means the crisis of modern world? What, what does that mean? If we, uh, we understand it perfectly, we will bring this end nearer to us nearer to us. We don't let it continue. So th that is a kind, a kind of eschatological, uh, eschatological struggle for ending end, for ended end, against everlasting end. That is maybe in this situation transi transition will be formed as a kind of uh, Subversive, subversive political, intellectual, maybe also national strategy, because we could find among the enemies of modernity, of liberalism, not only persons as well ourselves, but also movement, groups, and states, and religions, and something that is more or less serious. Uh, so we could promote the end to the liberalism and should struggle for the end of liberalism, uh, trying to bring it closer, trying to to end the end, the end the ending. So the idea is also transition is is not something that we should await. That transition is something that we should create, should bring. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, third aspect, uh, the idea that um, consumerism is uh, now above uh, all. I think that the, the most absolute consumer is robots. Because uh, uh, now consumers in, in the West and elsewhere, uh, they have not only demands that uh, Sub, uh, global supply would satisfy. They have not demands. All demands of consumer society are completely artificial. We badly need something that we not, don't need at all. And uh, we hysterically want to consume something that is uh, uh, very dangerous for us. And we don't need it. We don't want it. It's a kind of manipulation of will. There's a kind of simulacrum of desire that uh, is a consumer society. So I think that we should try to deconsume. Uh, we, we, we should um, destroy the things and destroy not only the products, but destroy our desire. For example, the desire to watch TV. It's a kind of scene, I think. At, at watching TV, you, uh, you agree to be more stupid, stupid any any moment, any channel, any any language, you're uh, the kind of lobotomia, and you agree. Oh, what is going on? That, that's very. Uh, for example, don't have TV, and destroy TV, and destroy all the kind of mass media uh, press. Not by the sectarian or uh, uh, fanatic attitude, but by the will, by the freedom. They say us, you are free. So if we are free, we are free. Don't consume, consume, not consume at all. Not see you, not hear you, not have you around me. And 
it could start as invitation uh, then it will be a kind of mode then we could think how promote this mode of uh, de-consuming uh, through the social network and we will see uh, who will win in this situation we should uh, use and consume uh, the possibility of consumer society uh, to make a course circuit short uh, uh, color uh, um, when two uh, plus and minus are joined short uh, yes, uh, so th that is a kind uh, to use, uh, as Evola said, we need to transform the poison in the cure, or uh, cure with the poison. So um, um, I think that uh, consumers should be um, annihilated uh, as a person, as a social construct. So we need to consume and teach the other how to do that. But before that, we should imagine how to be consumed. Uh, so, um, but uh, the direction is in this, in this sense. So, uh, we could not propose to the consumeristic society something better to consume. We could only propose one thing, a kind of zero consumption. Um, I would just add on practical measures. Uh, we spoke briefly about this personally. I think as a short-term measure, um, a very, uh, the, the end goal, as we see it, of the fourth political theory is not the nation state, but of civilizations, but as a short-term measure, a very strict uh, and very brutal resuscitation of sovereignty uh, at the state level, both politically uh, and economically, essentially. I, I, very importantly, economically. Um, and uh, I don't believe that individual action uh, has any effect. If you go smash your TV, that's great, but it's not going to change anything. It's a moral stance. Um, but we seek to, we must seek to radically uh, and in almost uh, subversive guerrilla tactics resuscitate uh, traditional culture and religion. Yes. That is philosophical question. Where is new uh, from? Well, from where we produce new ideas, new concepts, and so on. Um, the modernity affirms that the new is creation, and pre-modernity declares that the new is something taken from the eternity. So eternity is one thing that is completely new, because it is completely new for the any moment of time. And now we should be more creative and imagine new thing, but not cre uh, not creating in, in the technical sense. We should discover, we should understand, we should rediscover metaphysical horizon uh, of, of the being and eternity as the other side of the time. And from the chaotic eternity, we should take in more, much more new ideas than this exhausting modernity. Because uh, concre uh, actual liberal, uh, liberalism doesn't imagine anything. The problem is there is nothing new. There's re recyclation of something that was already. Uh, um, the idea that uh, liberalism or actual modernity produce something new, it, it doesn't uh, correspond to the state of fact. It uses the past. It uh, sells us. It sells us the past and recyclation. That's the main 
topics of postmodernity to recycle to to uh, uh, citations so uh, the absolutely new thing we could find only an absolute in eternity and i think that in the creativity we will win them because uh, we uh, i think that the act of absolutely art and creativity will be destruction of liberalism so we will to be liber uh, free from the freedom fighters to be uh, liberated from the liberals a completely uh, uh, completely cre uh, creative act because after that we will see new horizon a completely new solution for the existing problem maybe the problems we are dealing with also were and m m m most of them were created by the modernity and will be cured when the modernity will disappear. And with the rest, we will deal basing on the laws or uh, inspiration of uh, eternity. Sophia Perenis. Um, technology is a weapon, but it is a double-edged sword. And I see industrial civilization, particularly an industrial civilization based on infinite growth and consumerism, uh, is on the quick path to destroying itself, not only in the case of climate change, but of a whole uh, rare, a whole battery of planetary boundary limits that we have already passed. Um, our goal in the interim is to use the tools of modernity, social media, networks, uh, um, other forms of technology against modernity as a destructive attack. And we can see, uh, particularly in such hacker communities uh, and amenities, that basically turn the system, uh, the financial systems, the, uh, the technologies against themselves. But we must also recognize that we cannot create anything with technology. Um, we must uh, look uh, to uh, more uh, metaphysical, more uh, aesthetic for a creation of the future. We can only use technology uh, to destroy it. We still have time for one more question, or maybe two. Please. Yes. Uh, eight years ago, uh, Antonio Gramsci founded the Frankfurt School, and uh, <coughs> the main idea they brought forth was uh, cultural Marxism, and it took over the United States in the 1950s, and it, now it has taken over the whole Western world. And I think that to fight modernity, you also have to fight cultural Marxism, but then you have to expose cultural Marxism and the Frankfurt School in the media. I agree, principally, but uh, I think that uh, Gramsciism should not be uh, fight, but should should be uh, accept as a kind of of instrument. Gramsciism from the right, for example, Gramsci has uh, indicated that a very important issue of political and historical dimension is decided by the cultural intelligentsia. So we need infiltrate intelligentsia. We, we need uh, influ we need influence intelligentsia, and uh, we should fight uh, on the level of the ideas. The idea of of Gramsci was to fight against hegemony hegemony of capitalism in intellectual, non direct with that uh, uh, with the, the intellectual level where there is not. Production. There is not class. There are only people who m making uh, pictures and, and, and uh, ri ri writing books. But Gramsci uh, has uh, shown that making picture or writing poetry, you represent some strategical ideological patterns. For, for example, in the capitalist society, capitalist. Uh, uh, set of values. So we need to promote by the way of culture, art, intellectual practices uh, our position. Eurasianism, multipolarity, identitarism also. We need, for example, in Italia, when uh, some uh, brightest as uh, Fini groups of uh, MC, Movimento Sociale Italiano, uh, have arrived to the power. I, I have good relations with them. They discovered that they have the political posts 
but they have not cultural tradition, cultural weapon. And they were completely isolated because they never thought seriously about Gramscism, uh, how traditionalists or identitarists should use this uh, counter hegemonic weapon in the domain of art, of intellectual debate. So I think that it is very important. Gramscism is not uh, to be criticized or deconstruct, but accept Gramscism with the different uh, uh, content. That was idea of Alain de Benoit when he started uh, now 40 year, years ago, New Right. That was his idea. I think it's very, very important. I think this idea of cultural Marxism is a, in my opinion, a misunderstanding uh, popularized in, in the European New Right. Um, what we call cultural Marxism, uh, liberalism has adopted the methodology of Gramsci with none of the content. Now, I don't believe the content of Gramsci uh, is of any particular use to us in a 21st century context. But as Professor Dugan said, his methodology is sound. Uh, liberalism has used it to establish hegemony. We must use it to fight hegemony. Please. Uh, what, what do you think your influence was uh, Russia, Russia's response to the Georgian war? To the Georgian? Uh, I think that it is completely impossible scenario that Georgia could attack Russia. Uh, but um, it was very interesting situation in the August uh, 2008 when, when uh, Eurasian uh, youth movement uh, was in certain Ossetia from where are the pictures of myself with uh, weapon. So uh, that, uh, there, uh, there were some camps of paramilitary style uh, where participated some hundreds of uh, Ura uh, young Eurasianists. And after that, the part of them was in Skin Valley and were witnesses of this attack of Georgia. And we could uh, we could identify that these attack on Skidvali as a kind of war of Georgia against against Russia. That was once, because uh, there were many Russian military troops uh, around that. And uh, the problem was not Georgia. The problem was not American instructors there in Georgian army. It is for Russian actual state of army that job. The problem was uh, decision of to to respond military because on Putin on Medvedev, most of all on Putin, there was uh, without precedence pressure from the West not to respond uh, with all arguments used, and the problem is will, not capacity, but will. And when the decision was taken to respond after that, the war with Georgia, uh, re really, that was in the reality, was won without problem, with difficulty. Uh, so, uh, also, what most important, what is in the soul and, and in the mind of Putin, for example, it is, it is of absolute importance, not the state of army, because the state of uh, the possibility of Russia uh, are less than before, much less, much lesser, but anyway, it's still huge, and uh, with possible conflict, technically, it is not a great problem to, to overcome. The only, only problem, we have a very large fifth column of a uh, uh, kind of network uh, in Russia. They act in the sense of the West, of the liberalism. Uh, they influence very much 
different level of Russian society and have very strong influence on Putin also. So it is a kind of uh, struggle to, to, to win the war with Georgia, not uh, Georgia, uh, not Russian troops, uh, but um, correct attitude of Russian political leadership. And uh, that is a kind of prize, I think, uh, that uh, for different forces uh, in mortal struggle and very, very um, dramatic and uh, sometimes a, a tragic struggle. So uh, Putin is undermined from inner uh, situation. And that is a, a, a real problem. The real war uh, with uh, the liberalism is inside Russia, the real Georgia, because Georgia is a very, uh, very good uh, country with perfect traditional, traditionalist population, orthodox traditionalist population with uh, unique uh, ethnical culture. I, I adore. Um, I, I like very much uh, uh, Georgians, but uh, now the political leadership of Georgia is Atlanticist. They are a puppet of the United States, and that is not fault of the people. That is a kind of strategy deliberately accepted by the political, political leaders. So uh, we never uh, fight with Georgians or with the Georgia as a country, because it's it's very close to us by many, many weeks. We are struggling against this kind of unipolarity or colonization or geopolitical Atlanticism. And this struggle is continuing now. It is not uh, stopped in the 2008 or, um, but it is the struggle that uh, gas now and uh, with um, undefined end, because it is very difficult to resist uh, such huge uh, pressure from uh, the West and the United States, first of all. I've written extensively on the geopolitics of the August War, uh, in particular as a proxy war that the US uh, used this neoliberal Saakashvili regime that they have been stalled. Uh, not only against Russia, but for wider geopolitical purposes, uh, partly aimed against Iran. Uh, if Just take one of my cards, and uh, I'll send you my work on it. Thank you very much. I can see there are still several hands in the air. I mean, that is, there is so much interest, but unfortunately we are running short of time, and we will have to end the program now. Uh, let's give... Uh, uh, Thank you, gentlemen, for the rest of the